be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Bruce Lee is immortal. It's been 50 years since this insanely popular martial art legend died. Lee was relatively young when he died at 32, with. What he has achieved, his death was impactful and fans have never totally recovered. Also with viral rumors surrounding his death, there is no way fans could forget. These rumors have even accused the legend of drug use. Now his daughter, Shannon Lee, has come out to speak about Bruce Lee to defend him. What did she say? Why were the people shocked? Stay tuned, early life and family. Bruce Lee, whose original name was Lee Junfen, was born in 1940 in San Francisco, California, while his parents traveled around the United States for an opera tour. His dad, Lee Hoi Chuan, became a significant person in Hong Kong as a famous Cantonese opera singer and actor. Meanwhile, his mom, Grace Ho, came from a respectable family in Hong Kong with a mix of English, Chinese, and Dutch roots. After Bruce was born, his family quickly returned to Hong Kong, where he grew up. The Lee family lived the good life in Hong Kong, thanks to his dad's successful acting career. They had all the comforts and luxuries you could imagine. They were living the dream. During World War II, from 1941 to 1945, the Lee's family's lives were dramatically altered by the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong. Like many Chinese families at the time, the Lee family faced significant challenges, enduring hardships, and scarcity while navigating through the war's difficulties. Despite their relentless struggles, they confronted adversity until the Japanese forces surrendered in 1945. After the war ended, Hong Kong began its reconstruction, offering hope and resilience to its people. Despite the chaos, Lee's father continued his opera career using fame to provide certain privileges for his family. As the aftermath of the war settled, these privileges translated into opportunities, including Lee's enrollment at Tucson School at the age of 12, signifying a new era of stability and growth amid the post-war reconstruction efforts. Lee was this lively kid who just couldn't sit still in school. He tried hard at Tucson School, but his energy got in the way of learning. His parents thought a different school might help, so they switched him to Catholic LaSalle College and St. Francis Xavier's College, hoping for a better fit. But he still struggled with his studies, and on top of that, he was getting into fights a lot. As he got older, Lee found himself in more and more trouble with local gangs. It was his way of showing how frustrated and fed up he was. Seeing that things were getting out of control, his parents knew they had to do something they decided to give him direction and discipline, sending him to learn Wing Chun Kung Fu with a respected teacher named Master Yip Man. At first, Lee had trouble starting his martial arts journey because he was of mixed race. Some traditional Chinese masters weren't sure about letting him join because he wasn't entirely Chinese. Luckily, a friend helped him get into Wing Chun. However, even after getting in, Lee faced more problems because of his mixed background. Some of the other students didn't like that he wasn't entirely Chinese when they found out. This struggle to be accepted in martial arts was similar to Lee's more significant challenge with fitting in and being accepted when he was growing up. If only they could have known Lee was going to revolutionize how people saw martial arts. At 18, Lee's ability was unmatched in Hong Kong, fueled by his commitment to learning from Yip Man and his devoted peers. His remarkable progress earned him widespread admiration. But while Lee excelled in the ring, his parents grew more worried. His involvement in street fights and risky matches weighed heavily on them. The situation escalated when he clashed with a rival gang member, prompting his parents to step in and take action. Before Lee's 19th birthday, his parents decided to send him off to the United States. They believed he'd have better opportunities there and hoped he'd steer clear of trouble with the law. They had family in San Francisco, including his older sister Agnes, and some close family friends, so it seemed like a good fit. Lee first moved to San Francisco before settling in Seattle to finish high school. 
Over the following years, Lee threw himself into his education and mastering martial arts while adapting to life in Seattle. Balancing schoolwork with martial training, he moved between different friends' homes and took on odd jobs to make ends meet. In 1961, Lee's ambition and dedication reached a pinnacle as he founded his martial arts academy in Seattle's lively cityscape. Simultaneously, he pursued academic pursuits at the steamed University of Washington, exploring philosophy and drama. This scholarly journey parallels his unwavering dedication to mastering martial arts and passing on his growing expertise to eager students. Lee was a contradiction, a philosopher and a fighter. During this time, amidst his balancing act, Lee seized the chance to share his martial arts knowledge by developing his unique interpretation of Wing Chun, drawing from various fighting styles learned from his diverse experiences. He created a blend that broke traditional boundaries. The Jeet Kun Do among his earliest students were Jesse Glover, who later became his trusted assistant instructor and a group of judo practitioners introduced to him by his friend and mentor, Jameis Yu. This period began Lee's transformative journey as a martial artist and educator, laying the foundation for his significant impact on combat sports worldwide. Bruce Lee's passion for martial arts overshadowed his interest in academia. The success of his martial arts school and the excitement around his innovative Jeet Kune Do techniques convinced him to leave college. He realized his true calling was in the dojo where he could shape the future of martial arts. In 1964, Bruce Lee was invited to showcase his skills at the prestigious Long Beach International Karate Championships. He wowed the crowd with his legendary one-inch punch, demonstrating incredible power and accuracy. When volunteer Bob Baker stepped forward, Lee's punch knocked him back, causing significant pain and requiring several days of recovery. Then came one of the fiercest battles in martial art history. For the fight, Bruce Lee faced Wong Jackman, a respected Kung Fu master from San Francisco's Chinatown. Their match was tense and awesome. Why did those two clash? Wong reportedly wasn't a fan of Lee's approach to teaching martial arts. Wong wanted to beat Lee to prove that Lee's style was inferior. While the details of the fight are debated, one thing is clear. Lee won, establishing himself as a top figure in martial arts. His victory showed that he had the right to teach anyone, regardless of race or background. He highlighted Lee's dedication to inclusivity and innovation at this moment, solidifying his legacy as a martial arts pioneer. The heights he reached made people believe something deeper and darker happened that caused his death. Bruce Lee's death rumors and conspiracy Bruce Lee's daughter, Shannon, is trying to understand why people have crazy opinions about what truly happened to her father when her father died. Bruce Lee was athletic and he looked pretty healthy. But one day in July, he collapsed at a friend's house in Hong Kong after taking medicine for a headache. Even though he was taken to the hospital, he sadly died soon after. Doctors said he had swelling in his brain, which caused his death. But because Bruce Lee was an icon who, as we mentioned, looked so athletic, his death was unexpected, people started talking about what happened. Lies became truths for many. After Bruce Lee's death, people spread rumors about his death. Some theories claim the legendary martial art artist died during an affair. Others said he was secretly having drug problems as experts found illegal substances in his body. It didn't matter to them that experts said it didn't cause his death. They believed he used a lot of illegal substances. Then, maybe because of his past of busting up gang members, rumors say he was involved with the triad. That's not all the rumors said. Some claimed he died after a wild party and strange adult games. Her father's reputation from all the gossip was hard. Then people thought Bruce Lee was having an affair with Betty Ting Pei instead. Fans blamed her for his death and she got threatened. Even though there was no proof they were together, people still believed it, which hurt Bruce Lee's reputation. Some people said Betty Ting Pei might have worked for a, the triads and wanted to kill Bruce. Others blamed Raymond Chow, 
saying he wanted to control Bruce's movies after he died. Then the rumors got creepier. Some people believed there was a curse on Bruce Lee's family because his brother died tragically before he was born. They thought Bruce and his son Brandon died in similar ways because of this curse. Are they onto something? We don't think so, but what do you think? Despite decades since Bruce Lee's death, wild conspiracy theories continue to circulate. Bruce Lee's wife, Linda, had to defend him from these hurtful rumors. And for Shannon, Bruce Lee's daughter, protecting her father's memory became a full-time job. And it was a challenging task of defending her father's reputation over and over again. As the sole inheritor of the Bruce Lee estate, Shannon is committed to preserving her father's memory and ensuring his talents. Inspire future generations. Navigating through these persistent rumors and innuendos has proven to be a significant challenge for Shannon. However, she remains steadfast in her dedication to upholding her father's legacy. Rather than indulging in conspiracy or controversy, Shannon shares her father's invaluable teachings including his magnetic personality, strong work ethic, and exceptional martial arts skills. By doing so, she keeps Bruce Lee's memory alive and continues to honor his enduring influence on the world. Shannon finds discussing her father's lasting impact very inspiring. She thinks Bruce Lee was ahead of his time, emphasizing his deep philosophical beliefs and commitment to self-improvement. In a recent interview, Shannon shared how her father prioritized mental growth as much as physical fitness. She explained how Bruce had a unique ability to turn his thoughts into reality, making him a symbol of boundless potential. However, despite these insights, it's uncertain whether Shannon's tell-all will uncover the truth about Bruce Lee's life or just add to the mystery. Shannon vehemently denied accusations about her father's supposed involvement in crime and drug use. She criticized the media for trying to connect his death to debts with the triads, cocaine use, or romantic problems, calling these suggestions outrageous. Shannon insisted that her father never used hard drugs despite medical evidence, saving he had cannabis in his system. She said the media chose to sensationalize his death instead of sticking to the facts. According to Shannon, her father's passing was much less scandalous than the tabloid story suggested. She explained that he died from complications after taking pain medication during his recovery from a previous health issue, which caused an allergic reaction, not an overdose. Shannon isn't interested in conspiracy theories or controversies as Bruce's devoted daughter. She's focused on preserving her father's true essence by sharing his talents and teachings. Rejecting sensational claims, Shannon wants to pass on Bruce Lee's deep philosophies and unstoppable drive, the qualities that made him a legend. She proudly said that even after 50 years, her father still represents the highest human achievement and potential. But Shannon worries that fewer people genuinely understand her father, allowing others to shape his story. That's why she's committed to speaking the truth, breaking the silence, and correcting misunderstandings about her beloved father, Bruce Lee. Truly, Lee didn't work hard for his fame, for him to be reduced to rumors. The pathway to fame, before Bruce Lee became global, he was already well known in martial arts circles for his unique Jeet Kune Do style. Many people wanted to learn from him because of his skills, but his big break came in 1967 at a karate competition in Long Beach. Hollywood producer William Dozier saw Lee's impressive performance and offered him a chance to audition for a TV show called Number One Son. Before that, Lee had started acting. In 1966, he got a role as Cato in a TV series called The Green Hornet, one of the first shows that introduced American audiences to martial arts on TV. There was also one other thing the show did. It helped make Bruce Lee famous. Following the sudden cancellation of the Green Hornet in 1967, Bruce Lee faced uncertainty and struggled to find stable work. But he remained determined to stay true to his martial arts roots. Bruce's friendship with another stuntman, whom he met on the show, was a turning point. They shared valuable knowledge about combat, enriching Bruce's understanding of martial arts. 
Despite the show's end, Bruce Lee's commitment to authenticity in martial arts continued. He made innovative adjustments to accurately showcase his Wing Chun techniques on screen, slowing down his moves for better filming. This dedication led him to establish the Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute in Los Angeles, where he began shaping his groundbreaking martial philosophy. Though starting small, this dojo laid the foundation for Bruce Lee's future success and influence in martial arts and cinema. Bruce Lee revolutionized martial arts by rejecting traditional styles' rigid confines, advocating for adaptability over adherence to a single method. Drawing from various disciplines, he curated techniques emphasizing pragmatism and innovation. Bruce Lee developed Jeet Kune Do in his Los Angeles school, blending Wing Chun Kung Fu, boxing, and fencing. His emphasis on adaptability and efficiency led him to integrate weight training into martial arts practice, enhancing athleticism. Lee prioritized practicality over tradition, focusing on practical techniques in actual combat situations. This holistic approach, addressing physical and mental aspects, shifted martial arts philosophy towards dynamic and versatile self-defense methods. Lee connected with influential students and supporters, including Hollywood scriptwriter Sterling Sant. With Sant's help, Lee landed gigs as a fight choreographer and minor actor. In 1969, he choreographed fight scenes for movies like Marlowe and The Wrecking Crew, and appeared on TV shows like Here Come the Brides and Blondie. Despite his efforts, Lee faced industry stereotypes based on ethnicity, limiting his access to leading roles and stifling his creativity. But during this time, Lee collaborated with screenwriter Sterling Sant and actor James Coburn on a film script called The Silent Flute. Though the project didn't happen, the experience provided valuable insights that influenced Lee's artistic vision and storytelling goals. But Lee wanted more. Hollywood was killing him. He was frustrated over his continual relegation to minor roles in Hollywood. He yearned to shine brightly on the silver screen and showcase his exceptional talents. During this crucial time, producer Fred Weintraub suggested a daring idea. He told Lee to return to Hong Kong to create a film that could highlight his remarkable abilities that would catch the eye of Hollywood's elite. Initially unaware of his rising fame in Asia, Lee was surprised to learn about the widespread acclaim he received for his role as Kato in The Green Hornet, affectionately known as The Kato Show in Hong Kong. This realization sparked a sense of possibility and opportunity within Lee. He considered using his newfound fame to achieve unparalleled success in cinema. The Big Boss, Lee started in The Big Boss, which was a massive hit in Asia despite not having a big budget. The movie showed Lee's excellent martial arts skills, and it was his first time being the main character. In the movie, Lee played a Chinese man who moved to Thailand to fight against drugs. Lee starred in another film, Fist of Fury, which was a big hit, just like The Big Boss. In the movie, Lee played a martial arts student who wants revenge for his master's murder in 1930s Shanghai. He fights using strong punches, high kicks, and cool nunchaku moves. Lee did all his stunts. Lee's highest grossing film, The Way of the Dragon, took in a staggering 5.2 million Hong Kong dollars. This film contained Lee's lengthy, iconic fight scene against Chuck Norris in the Coliseum. Their duel is considered one of the greatest fights in cinema, merging athleticism and brutality. Lee was given complete creative control for his third Hong Kong feature in 1972. He wrote, directed, produced, choreographed, and starred in the film as a young martial artist who defends family members threatened by the mob. Bruce worked on Enter the Dragon, which became a global phenomenon, earning over $90 million worldwide. It cemented Lee as a martial arts legend and sparked a worldwide kung fu passion. Set on an island hosting an international fighting tournament, Lee played a Shaolin monk recruited to spy on the proceedings. This was the first kung fu film produced by a major Hollywood studio, Warner Bros. Now a bona fide movie star, Lee founded Concord Production Inc. 
with Raymond Chow, his own production company. His next endeavor would be his first Hollywood co-production, 1973's Enter the Dragon. In the 1990s and 2000s, interest began to rise in Lee's unique martial arts and philosophical perspectives. Unfinished footage he had shot for his last film, Game of Death, was later cobbled together by Golden Harvest, using lookalike actors, stunt doubles, and existing Lee footage in 1978. Even after his shocking death, Lee's legend continued to grow. Lee emphasized emotional characterization and philosophy alongside physical technique. He pioneered martial arts choreography for the screen, using innovative camera angles and editing techniques. Lee became an international icon and introduced Chinese martial arts cinema to the mainstream. Tragically, just days before the premiere of his biggest hit, Bruce Lee died at age 32. Bruce Lee improved the connection between Hong Kong action cinema and Hollywood in an unparalleled way. His films catapulted the Hong Kong film industry onto the global stage. Setting the standard for excellence, he laid the groundwork for future martial arts legends like Jackie Chan and Jet Li. Lee's innovative fight choreography remains a benchmark in the industry, inspiring and influencing filmmakers today. If you've not subscribed to our channel, don't forget to do so. Share with your family and friends, and remember to give the video a thumbs up. Thank you.